Um, I've been working in technology for about 10 years. Um, one way I've been working in technology is an as an author. I've been writing a lot, articles, reports for the government, and books. And my first book was published seven years ago. It was titled L'Age de la Multitude. I wrote it with a friend called Henri Verdier, whom uh, many of you know, I guess. Um, and what was interesting working with Henri, he was the best co-author you could hope for because he had a strong background in publishing. He used to, to work in publishing. And so he knows the recipe for a successful book. And I'm going to share the recipe with you. So if, if you want your book to be successful as an author, you need to make sure that the book can be summed up in just one sentence that is very straightforward and very polarizing. People have to think about that idea and decide if they're for or against. And so before we even started writing the book, like outline, chapters, and so on, we did quite a lot of work. Like, how, um, Well, the book was about the digital economy, as, as simple as that. The goal of the book was to educate the French elite about the importance of technology and the importance of tech startups. Because Henri and I were in between two worlds. One was the world of uh, government and large old corporations. And the other world was that of entrepreneurs trying to build tech startups in Paris. And what we saw was a very wide gap between the two worlds who didn't really understand each other. Governments saw startups as nice little things like all those new young people with their computers, maybe they'll find a, right, uh, uh, a real job one day, like uh, uh, after those years uh, playing with computers. And on the other side, entrepreneurs saw the government as, as that large bureaucracy that always stands in the way. Uh, and I was amazed to realize that many of them didn't even know the difference between like an MP, a senator, a cabinet minister, a mayor, or a civil servant. Those are all bureaucrats that are uh, irrelevant and clueless and, 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 and make my life more difficult. So Henri and I wrote that book to try to bridge that gap. And so we needed that very simple idea to convey what the digital economy is about. And the idea we came up with that uh, we hope would make the book successful was that the digital economy is an economy in which there's more power outside than inside organizations, which is a, ra which is a radical change if you compare that to the industrial age of the 20th century. In the past, the, uh, the most powerful organizations were those who concentrated a lot of resources on the inside, like the more assets, the more employees, the most valuable brands and patents and the most powerful technology, all of that was on the outside. And the most powerful organizations were those who had the more resources. Today, in the digital economy, power has been displaced from the inside to the outside because we uh, individuals are more equipped with powerful devices and we're all connected together through networks. And that makes it possible for all of us to pool our individual power and to exert it to force organizations uh, to serve us better or to comply with what we want. And the most powerful organizations in that world, that was the thesis of the book, are those who realize that there's more power on the outside and that redesign themselves so as to harness that power and use it to generate, to, to, to reach whatever goal they have, like making profits, delivering public services, solving social problems, and so on. And so that's true for private organizations, corporations. It's true for government as well. And this idea, the idea that there's more power outside than inside, has been my framework for understanding and explaining everything that's going on as part of the current paradigm shift. And I've been doing that for seven years, and it's worked extremely well. I, I mean, this idea remains true over the years as the digital, digital economy uh, changes. And so last year, a friend of mine in 
Silicon Valley wrote me an email and said, there's this book by Martin Gurry called The Revolt of the Public, and it seems very much in line with this idea that you have that there's more power outside than inside organizations. And it so happens that with my colleague Zineb, we were about to travel to the US uh, on the East Coast, uh, including a few days in Washington, DC, and so I looked, um, and when I looked uh, Martin's Twitter account, I saw that he was based in um, Virginia. Vienna, Virginia. Vienna, Virginia. And so I decided to, uh, so I, I found uh, someone uh, at Stripe Press, who pub which published the book, and asked for an introduction. And so we had the opportunity to spend exactly one hour in a Starbucks in Fairfax, Virginia. And um, after that discussion, because it was so relevant to what's happening all over the world, but especially in Europe, and because it resonated so much with what, what was happening at the time in France with the Gilets Jaunes crisis and so on, we decided to invite Martin because we want, as the family, we want to use every opportunity to educate uh, the local elites, especially our governments, about what is going on. And Martin in this book provides the most convincing and compelling framework to understand uh, what's happening in politics these days. So I'm very happy to host you tonight and I leave you the floor to explain what's in the book and why you wrote it. Uh -oh. Thank you, Nicolas. Um, thanks, Zineb, for your uh, magnificent hospitality. Even though we have a, a, an old and, and deep relationship of one hour at Starbucks, uh, it's still pretty extraordinary. Thank you all for coming here. Um, hope to make it worth your while. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a broad brush for just a few minutes uh, of what the book is about and how it came to be about. And then um, maybe we can get into some questions uh, that can include the theory of what the book is about or not, but the whole, th the whole issue of, um, of the digital universe and its collision with, with the, the old ways of doing things. So does that make sense? Yes. All right. Once upon a time, what is it? Il était une fois, yes? Once upon a time, uh, I had what might be considered the least glamorous job in CIA. I was an analyst of global media. Now, that turned out to be, sheer dumb luck, possibly the most consequential spot to be perched in uh, for the changes that were going to happen in the world. Uh, when I started my career, I won't say that it was an easy job, but it was not overly complicated. If the President of the United States wanted to know about what, how are my policies playing in France, the number of, uh, the, the volume of open information was very small, and there was always something that set the agenda. In France, it would be Le Monde, or if you want Le Figaro, and that's it. That's, oh, I had new, two newspapers. And I could tell the president, yeah, this is what happened. Then things started to change. We noticed this, this remarkable change, this earthquake uh, that the digital revolution uh, began, generated this tsunami of information in volumes that um, were unprecedented in, in human experience. And, that's not just a phrase. They're actually very clever people who have measured in data bits how much information was produced in the year 2001 and 2002. This was the turn of the millennium. In the year 2001, the information produced was double that produced the entire of human history all the way back to the cave paintings. In the year 2002, double the amount of information produced from 2001. If you put that in a chart, and the chart is in the book, you, you have a tsunami, you have this enormous gigantic wave. So we were kind of astonished. The, the, the first reaction is, if you have a wave, of inf a flood of information, and you used to go into Le Monde and the Figaro, what do we go to now? 
But that was really incidental. As this tsunami swept over the world, and I was in my privileged place in CIA watching the tsunami sweep over the world, the world of media, we began to see increasing turbulence, social and political turbulence, that as the digital dispensation became more settled in those countries, became more and more aggravated. We heard voices, angry voices, mocking voices, where before there had been absolute silence. Um, we don't want to get into what the Egyptian media was like before the internet, but I mean, it was silence. This essentially was a silence, and suddenly there were these voices. So I left CIA. Uh, we said, by the way, look, something is happening. Um, CIA is a, an old and venerable hierarchy and is used to doing ways the way that hierarchies do. And they said, essentially, we get it. There are new voices, the people with their laptops, they're, they're blogging. And, but in the end, what political importance does it have? If, if the secret police comes in Egypt and puts a gun to the person's head, are they going to hit him with their laptops? And ha, ha, ha. So they did not buy into the idea that there was a profound transformation. I was watching this now as a private person. And I find that um, it, in the year 2011, uh, a certain what I called phase change occurred. In other words, it was a moment where the voices became actors in the street, demonstrators, protesters in the street all over the world, all over the world. You had the Arab Spring, which is very misnamed, but, but it was in many, many countries. Almost all of them began online. You had the indignados in Spain that, that began on Facebook. You had uh, the social protesters in Israel, they began on Facebook. You had uh, Occupy in the US, they didn't begin, begin on Facebook, but they use advantage of, of the web very much. Um, so you had this, this sweeping set of, of, uh, of political actions that actually changed politics in Spain and of course the Middle East in Israel. And so something was happening, something was happening. Um, and what became apparent to me and to some, of, some others uh, is that there is something about that gigantic volume of information that I was talking about before that is very destructive of authority. Um, that is not an intuitive proposition, but the world that existed before uh, the digital age, let me ask, how many of you here are 30 years or younger? I'm not going to ask older, but younger. How many? All right. Oh, my gosh. All right. You will be surprised that I am not one of you, OK? Um, basically, the world that existed before you were really a conscious creature, you young ones, uh, was very different from the one you live in today. It consisted, it basically had been shaped by the Industrial Age. The Industrial Age believed in these steep hierarchies and scientific control of the bottom by an elite that was very wise and rational and, and decisive and that solved problems. So they looked at even a politics as like a mathematical proposition you know, where there were problems to be solved. Unemployment is a problem. Uh, inequality is a problem. Well, of course, if you look at these things, these conditions, that's what they are. They're not problems closely, you realize they're a very complex tangle of things. Uh, but that's not the way it was looked at in the industrial age. And, and that mindset, uh, and, and it was not just government, it was the media, it was a scientific establishment, it was business. Um, that mindset could be sustained because in those days, Le Monde, Le Figaro, you had a very limited uh, amount of information. And each institution pretty much controlled its own domain of information. What happened was that tsunami blew that away. The second that enormous flood of information hits those institutions, you start watching them. The public trust erode in them because why? Well, 
Every error they make is now out in the open. Every failure uh, is out in the open. Uh, people are now talking about themselves. It's not that the corporations always or the, the hierarchy is talking down. People are now talking at, at, at the level of the public uh, and saying, look at this. Um, they're, they're failed. They're insincere. They're hypocritical. Um, basically, within a few years of, of that tsunami hitting the institution, I, it was pretty clear that a crisis of authority uh, had been instituted in uh, pretty much throughout the democratic world and beyond. There were actors in this, in this fight. One is the public. Who is the public? Well, the public is not the people because I'm here to tell you the people doesn't exist. I know to the French that that's, that might sound shocking, but in fact, the people are, it's, it's a category of political philosophy. There is no such thing as the people, that thing that you can point to, there's the people, it doesn't. The public is not the masses. That's 20th century thought, that's the industrial uh, thinking. It's not even the crowd on the street, although I always say, I don't know if those of you who are on Facebook, the relationship, they say, well, it's, it's uh, complicated. They have a, the, the, the public and the crowd have a very complicated relationship because you have your, your digital devices and there's a lot of interaction all the time. The public, in essence, is anybody, and I borrowed my definition from uh, an American thinker called um, um, Walter Lippmann. He said, the public is not a fixed body. The, the, the public is any group of individuals who are interested in an affair and are pursuing it uh, as, as either actors or by influencing other actors. So in the, in the contemporary setting, uh, there is no such thing as a public. There are many publics. It just sounds silly if you say publics in plural, so I always say it in singular. But when I say it, think of it more as a mosaic, as a fragment upon fragment. Um, that's one side of the fight. Uh, the other side of the fight are, of course, the elites that have, for the last 150 years, inhabited these great grand hierarchies that make the modern world possible. And um, the, the elites, of course, have most of the wealth, have just about all of the guns, but they have become very demoralized, uh, and very panic-stricken. and. Um, uh, so the equation is uh, as follows. The public, because of its um, ability to communicate instantaneously, literally uh, to, to assemble at the, at the speed of light, uh, can erupt unpredictably, and it is always unpredictable. unpredictable. This happens again and again and again, and it's always a surprise to the governments, to the elites. At any time, over any cause, uh, I always get asked, um, when is the next one going to happen? What's the next protest movement? Or why hasn't there been a protest movement in Australia? I get asked about Australia for some reason. And I always point to the Gilets Jaunes. I say, who the day before the Gilets Jaunes landed on the street would have said that this was going to happen in France to Emmanuel Macron, who, if you had read the cover of The Economist just a few months before, shows him walking on water. This is a man who was walking on water, okay? And suddenly, these people are coming and, and uh, he's not walking on water anymore, all right? Um, the story of my book, which is this thesis of, of, of the public in conflict with the elites. The public is, it has a certain dynamic. It is very fractured. If you had taken, if you take the Gilets Jaunes, if you take the crowd in Tahrir Square in Cairo, if you take the crowd in Puerta del Sol with the indignados, and you, you put them all in a room and you said, what do you want positively? What do you want to change? You will get a thousand different answers. There, there was no unity there. The, the public has no organization. It has no leaders. It is, in fact, profoundly anti-leader. Uh, this is, it comes from the, the web. I always say that the, the, uh, the internet loves to devour its heroes and you stand out too much, they, they come and destroy you. So uh, if you are an indignado or a, a gilet jaune and you say, I'm, a, I'm the one who speaks for, the, no, the, the other ones come and say, no, you don't, okay? Uh, the public has 
um, no ideology, no political program. So what does it have? How do you have this multifarious, fractured, disagreeing group, a multitude, you call it, this very disparate multitude suddenly unified? They're unified against, OK? That is the dynamic. In every instance, they're unified against. Um, if you happen to be in Egypt, you're unified against Hosni Mubarak. If you happen to be in France, uh, Gilles Jean, you are unified against Emmanuel Macron. If you are um, uh, an occupier in the United States, you're, you're against capitalism and Wall Street. Um, there is a very intense dynamic of uh, what I call negation uh, that almost invariably, and in, in, not always, but almost invariably, if you push it hard enough, leads logically to nihilism. In other words, the feeling that destroying the established order, this is all the, 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 the against is entirely about the status quo, the established order. Destroying the established order becomes a, um, a positive because let's just erase this and see what happens. There are no alternatives proposed. There is no wish to take over the government. In my day, when I was a young man, uh, back in the Jurassic era, um, uh, that if you wanted to be a radical, a revolutionary, you wanted to take over the government. You had a program you wanted to take over. The public today loathes the government, wants to take it down in the sense of you know, destroying the established order. But then when the question comes to who should be the one to change things, then it goes, well, it's you. It's you that has to change things. It's you, the government. So there's a profound contradiction there. And as I say, something that leads ultimately to, to, um, to a nihilistic mindset among a minority of them. But that's the danger. The danger is the nihilist. And, and frankly, um, when you think about terrible events like Bataclan or in the United States, the, some of the shootings. These are people who seem to have become the embodiment of the internet rant. They're like the rant made flesh. They're nihilists who believe that they are the only pure persons left in the world and the world has to be purified in, in, in blood. In blood. It, it, um, so the, if, when I say nihilist, I include those people, ISIS, uh, it's, it's a society based on nihilism when they had, when they had uh, territory that they had conquered. So that's the public. The elites, of course, have their own mindset. The elites believe that to get to where they are, you go to, and in France, I mean, this is, the, the, the elites are very elite. You go to certain schools, you go to certain schools, you get certain grades. Then, as a result of that, of course, you end up in certain positions of authority. You've earned this. You're a professional. You are knowledgeable. You're, you're scientific. You are rational. And when the sweep comes up from below of the public, as it did in Spain, as it did in Israel, there's this incomprehension. It's like, you're not rational. You're not, listen to me. I, I know what is best. Um, in the end, uh, the experience, my experience has been, um, there is a great deal of denial. The elites are terrified. The two things that I think the public wants, uh, bases its grievances on, one of them is distance, the sense, that the, um, the sense that the elites are in these enormous pyramids and they are at the top and they're looking down. And the elites' response to this desire to be brought down is actually to try and get higher away because they're terrified. They want to just, please, don't bring me close to these irrational mobs, these multitudes. Um, so um, right now, I think democracy is caught in this transition. We are in a tremendous secular transition. We are moving from that industrial age where the elites could say, Poof, do this, uh, and they could fail. I'm here to tell you, John F. Kennedy had a uh, Bay of Pigs that the CIA, my old, my organization, had engineered against Cuba, failed d disastrously. And his popularity and trust in him went up. Because in those days, everybody was in the same boat and nobody wanted the president to be a failure. So there was, a, there was an uptick in his, in his in trust of the, of the people for, for um, John F. Kennedy. 
President Obama came on the scene and within a year, he had uh, the Tea Party, which was his movement that essentially at the end destroyed his, his governing coalition before he had actually implemented his program. He had passed his program, but he hadn't really implemented it. So he didn't even get to prove whether he could do it or not. Donald Trump, he wasn't even in the White House and people were demonstrating in the streets saying, we hate him, we don't want him there, okay? So um, the difference between John F. Kennedy and, and Donald Trump is the measure of this transition where democracy has to be based on something other than I am a scientific leader uh, and, and I, I am a, um, a rational actor who can guide you to solve problems of, of, of political nature to something that reconciles this angry public uh, that, um, that democracy as it exists can be changed in a way that is it's flatter and that is less distant. Um, Many instances of this that we could talk about, and I'll let you, in your questions, um, ask the ones that are your favorites. The book, I'll tell you, the, the career of the book is an interesting one. I wrote it, and it kind of went like this, and then Brexit happened, and then Trump happened. And with Brexit and Trump, the book went like this, just like the tsunami, okay? Uh, it suddenly, it was like, oh, how do we explain these very strange things that, that are happening? Um, but honestly, um, when you look at, when I look at the British media, we have somebody here from the British Embassy, uh, when I look at the American media, what I see is an enormous amount of incomprehension, incomprehension. Uh, there is the sense that people are being manipulated, fake news, and we can talk about that if you want to, I'll, I'll let you ask the question, uh, fake news, and in other words, whatever happened, Brexit, Trump, they had, you know, Italy, same thing happening over and over, whatever happened didn't really happen. There was some nefarious force, some elite is manipulating this because it is not possible for the public to be an actor. There has to be an elite that is manipulating the public from somewhere. Maybe if it's Vladimir Putin, I mean, that could be him. Um, so if you look at what happened in the United States, um, Donald Trump essentially was elected, I think. You, you look at Donald Trump as a candidate and you say, well, this man had zero government or military experience. He had um, no ideological following. He was not well known to the political elites. He didn't have, didn't have a lot of connections and did not have anything that particularly qualified him to, um, to be president. And you can say that he won the election despite that, but that would be a mistake. He won the election precisely because of that. Um, the public was looking for someone, the angry public, which is in negation mode, and is looking at the established order and is saying, I want to bash those people and, and you're way up here and I'm talking to you and you're not listening to me. Um, and to me is what the modern artist had a word for when you would find something to make art, the objet trouvé, you know. Uh, Trump was an objet trouvé. I mean, they found him and, and they used him for, the, for their, their purposes. Uh, he was, um, and I think in his campaign, much more than as a president, very nihilistic. He said crazy things all over the place. Because of that, because of that, he signaled to the public, I, I am not one of them. I am not one of them. So um, the dynamics involved need to be understood. Uh, I think the book um, seeks to do that, and I think pretty, pretty accurately. Um, but if you listen to the American media, th there's still a state of incomprehension, still a state of incomprehension. Um, they cannot believe that there is uh, any legitimacy to the public, and the public no longer believes there's any legitimacy to the elites. So um, we need to transact this, this, this moment. 
Uh, we need to somehow make government and the digital universe, both of them, congruent with democracy. I mean, I always remark that the, the industrial model of democracy is not particularly democratic. The model I was born in, uh, where the president, like John F. Kennedy, would say, this is the way things are, and we watch him on te little televisions, and we go, yes, and we support him. Uh, but there were two parties, and they believed in the same thing, pretty much, and uh, the choices were tiny. Um, so it was not very democratic. So the possibility opens up of a much more democratic world, but what is happening right now is not that. What is happening is a sort of a turbulence. We're, this, we're an airplane that's hit this enormous gust of storm and this, this tremendous turbulence, and democracy is, is, is not a given. Um, my background is Cuban. I always say that before I was 10 years old, I experienced a dictatorship of the right and a dictatorship of the left. And again, I'm here to tell you the worst democracy is better than the best dictatorship. So my concern is that in this turbulence that we are caught on between uh, the public, the gilets jaunes, the indignados, the Trump followers, and the elites who uh, understand the system, know how to manage structure, uh, have for 150 years generated a lot of prosperity and education, after all, and, and, and uh, mobility. Um, this conflict has to be managed in a way that our democracy, our industrial democracy is digitized and so it becomes, becomes reconciled to the digital world and the public is therefore reconciled to, to um, liberal democracy. I know that you, um, you draw some kind of a parallel between Trump and Macron, explaining that Macron is as much a product of the revolt of the public as Trump is, but on the other hand, they're so different, and Macron didn't even survive the, uh, well, the, the public that had elected him with the Gilets jaunes crisis, so how come the revolt can lead to such different outcomes? That's a really good question. Um, Donald Trump, of course, the word populist, by the way, no populist ever calls himself a populist. But I mean, so if you wanna know what, when I use that word, this is how I define it. I think there is an enormous distance between the public and the elites, because the elites have withdrawn, and the populists have moved into and occupied that space. There are people who are now occupying the space where the elites used to be, but they have not withdrawn into the tippy top of the pyramid. Um, so Trump is a full bore populist uh, in many different ways that we can discuss later on. Emmanuel Macron, the economist, when they made him walk on water, and uh, the general impression of, of, of Macron, I think in the United States and probably in Europe, is that he was almost like the savior of the established order. Look, he won this big election, and he was a, he's ex exactly the opposite of a populist. But if you look at what happened in France, that was not the case. Many of the characteristics of populism attached themselves to the Macron campaign. En marche did not exist one year before the elections. These were new people. These are all new people. That's what happens with populism. Trump brought in a bunch of new people also. Um, Macron himself had never run for office. Okay, that had never happened before. Our candidate uh, that had never run for office uh, became president of the Fifth Republic. That had never happened. So he was, in many ways, a creature of uh, the revolt of the public. Now, so he had the possibility, I always felt he had this glittering possibility, Emmanuel Macron did, of marrying the, this, this tremendous political energy that the public releases when it becomes engaged in politics today to the stability and the purposefulness of, of the institutions. Something new could have been done there. Um, it did not happen. It did not happen, and there are many reasons for that. Um, he was, my, to make it as simple as I can, is, is his heart was at the center with the elites. And his rhetoric 
was very much at the center with the elites. And he did not understand, I think, the way that I think Donald Trump does understand, that there is this angry rebellion. He didn't realize that he was leading kind of a, more than a, a political movement, it was a kind of a, a, a turbulent uh, passage through the institutions of the Fifth Republic, okay? He didn't realize that. He thought it was a lot simpler than that. And um, the revolts are very unpredictable, very random. Uh, he's clearly, something about him, his demeanor, his language, his background, you know, the fact that he went to all the best schools, uh, made him very disliked by these people who eventually became the Gilets jaunes. He did not address their, their uh, you want to call it prejudices, you want to call it their, their emotional needs, their, their political needs, the way that Trump, with his crazy tweets and, and all the um, strange, sometimes borderline nihilistic, certainly sometimes uh, inappropriate language that he uses in his tweets, but that's, that's feeding that beast, the popular beast of the, 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 the public. He understands that, 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 that possibility of he being the object of a revolt is there. He feeds the public enough that it hasn't happened yet. It may still, but it hasn't happened yet. I think Macron was very, very innocent about what he represented. Uh, and I think he missed what might have been that he could go back. I mean, nothing, it's not all, he's very early in his, uh, in his tenure. He seems to have, in some ways, I mean, the Gilets jaunes seem to have peaked and now they're, they're going in the other direction. Let's see, he had the great, you know, the grand debat, and I don't know what you guys feel about that, but it seems to me like that was an interesting thing that was done. Um, whether something was learned uh, in, in a way that he can now connect to that public so that the distance is lessened, we shall see. And I have another question and then we'll open up to, to the audience. But so the last time we went through this transition and installed the industrial age, which was more or less one century ago, it ended up with the rise of fascism and World War II, which yeah. had quite an impact here in Europe. Basically, half of Europe was entirely destroyed. Millions of people died. So are, are we going forward to such an outcome or do we have reasons to hope that maybe we can skip that part and discover the new way of making democracy works. Okay, as you know full well, I don't do prophecy. I mean, I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you a secret, which is that the business model for the CIA is prophecy. The CIA tells the president of the United States what's going to happen tomorrow. When tomorrow looks like yesterday, they're always right. When tomorrow doesn't look like yesterday, they're always wrong. Okay, so I learned watching my own organization kind of like flounder. I think uh, um, human, human um, interactions, human relations are so complex that uh, they can't be uh, predicted, but I will, I will address that, I will address it. I, I don't believe the 20 teens are anything like the 1930s. Um, first of all, I don't think that's when the industrial transition happened. The industrial transition happened somewhat earlier. It was it was still ongoing, but it happened earlier. Secondly, the economic situation is very different. Often, and, and again, I ask you to challenge me on this, often the case is made that it's globalization. It's, it's that all this, all this um, turbulence is, um, is, is economic based and uh, globalization has created these structural inequalities and this is why they're angry. But if that were the case, I would think the people who are uh, in the street protesting would be the poorest and the most marginalized, uh, the, the racial minorities, the religious minorities. It never is. You read this book, there, there are uh, many, many case studies of these demonstrations. There it wasn't a single one in which the people demonstrating were not middle class, sometimes affluent middle class. Um, so I think the economy of the 20 teens is very different from the economy of the 1930s. Um, I think the dynamic is a different dynamic. Um, I think what we have to fear is, is not um, some Führer or Duce um, 
bringing power to the top and 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 then posing a totalitarian solution on on society but the opposite i think it's the opposite i think when you look at democratic governments all around the world they're very weak they're very confused they don't know what's happening i mean poor emmanuel macron had to sit down hour after hour listening to people say well this is what i think is important why because he was confused he didn't why why is this happening this is and he france is not alone this is true of every democracy um, the true danger, I think, is um, violence from nihilism. The, if we accept that the public is broken up into fragments, there are many of these fragments that are becoming increasingly more violent in their language and sometimes become violent in, in reality. Um, but they're not trying to take over the... the um, the government, they're not trying to impose a totalitarian, it's a moment of disorganization, disintegration, turbulence, uh, that what is what has to be managed and, and the peril and, and I think the, um, uh, the, 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 the worst possible outcome would be for these nihilists to be given free, free play as, as for example in Syria to do horrible things because they believe that modern life needs to be abolished and we're gonna do it in blood. Um, not necessarily from uh, the top of a very uh, structured pyramid, but from a sectarian perspective, very sectarian. Thank you uh, uh, for uh, explaining all of that to us and sharing what's in the book. And I hope it has inspired some questions. Wow, all right. Oh, great. Hi, uh, I Hi. just wanted, um, what path do you see to leaderships of the, uh, leadership of the public? What uh, common traits and characteristics do you see in uh, modern um, leaders of the public and how uh, could that be done? What relationships uh, does the public have? Uh, what are characteristics? Uh, more what, uh, what strategies, strategies? Uh, could be ways to lead the uh, modern public who is very decentralized and against all the time? And yeah, I get asked that question a lot too. Um, I have a, a, a cowardly answer that I give, which is I'm, I'm the doctor that diagnoses the illness. I'm not the doctor that's got the cure necessarily, okay? Um, there are certain things that I, seem to me obvious uh, in an age of fragmentation um, when these, these mosaic bits are each of them very passionate and, and, and very, very much bound in negation against one another and then against the system, imposing one size fits all solutions, you know, the big policy solutions from the top is inviting, inviting a revolt, okay? Because that, those solutions are gonna fit some people but are gonna alienate most. So decentralization, I would think, is, is one, uh, one possible way to look at that. Um, I mean, I have thought, and if, if I sound like a crazy person, then, you know, tell me. Um, I have thought about our elite class, and I'm not going to talk about here in France because I don't, I don't really want, know them, um, but I'm going to talk about the United States. And I am, having been born in Cuba, I am not a revolutionary. I am not a violent person. I, I have come to the conclusion that the industrial elites, the people who are bred to thinking that because I went to certain schools and, and earned certain positions and have, are now at the top of these particular institutions, they have somehow authority, um, that class has to go away. That class has to go away. Uh, it can go any number of ways. Uh, one way is I look at you and I look at me. When you take over, you will be um, far more adept at dealing with um, the flatness of the digital world and the proximity of the, of the digital world than the people who are there now. And I meet a man like Emmanuel Macron who's only 40 years old. His mind is at least 20 years older because he went through all the schools. Um, so I think how do we get, first we need an elite that can talk to the public in a way that the public understands. 
um, the elites in, in the, um, the old model talk to each other. They talk to each other. They, they want to impress. They're validated. They're existentially validated when other elites say, you've done, yeah, look, you, you're a good, good politician, say the other politicians, or you're a good CEO, say the other CEO. And that's what they like. Down here, the customer, the voter, who cares? He's not paying any attention. That's, that's going to change. That's going to change. Um, how it's going to change, it may be generational. It may be how we select our elites. And if you look at the very end of the book, um, I do essentially a riff on uh, a Spanish philosopher, Jose Ortega Gasset, who said, and I agree with him, that there is a dynamic between the public and the elites. The public, in a sense, selects the elites. It's almost Darwinian. They select the elites. We vote for them. We buy their products. We watch them on television or in the movies. Okay. So if you don't like what is happening and you're a member of the public, maybe you should look in the mirror and say, well, who am I supporting? That isn't like that. Uh, and then identify the virtues that we're going to need for the next period. And, and I have my ideas about that, but I won't go into it right now. Uh, and when you look at politicians, choose those that have that, that virtue. I mean, they're there. They, they have to be there. And set your expectations rationally. They're, because the elites um, probably exaggerate, certainly exaggerate the, the you know, irrationality of the public. They just want to discredit anything that's not professional and, and scientific and rational. But the public, frankly, wants to be told, I'm going to your, 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 I'm gonna solve your problem. I know you have big problems in life. I am going to solve them. I think part of what has happened, part of what this um, dynamic is, is um, the younger generation is very detached from, say, religion, very detached from community, much, very mobile. Uh, Sometimes even families are not particularly strong. And so they expect politics to deliver a kind of existential meanings that politics was not set up to do. And I think as members of the public, we need to pitch our expectations rationally. I mean, that's true, realistically anyway. Um, if you look at the record, governments are not really good at managing the economy. They're not really good at um, uh, solving inequality. It's simply, we don't know how to do those things. They're too complex. So I'm not a pessimist, but I am a believer that we're in the early moment. I think this turbulence is going to last a while. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm not a believer that these are impersonal forces, you know, like you have in Marxism, you know, the class struggle, and this happens regardless of what you as an individual do, there's going to be this this movement of history. History doesn't move by itself. It's you who are here and all of us who carry it in our shoulders, okay? Um, so in part, how do we do it? It's gonna be you. It's gonna be you. Thanks. All right. um, do I speak into this? Thank you. Um, it's very interesting. Thank you very much for this. You, you say you're not a pessimist, but I, I have to say I found your presentation a little pessimistic. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, because I work on Brexit a lot, obviously, on the UK. Um, so there's a few things I wanted to ask for you. I wanted to get your view on, do you think we also, in the middle, or perhaps we've had for a long time, a crisis of authority? What, I mean, I, I speak, for instance, authority, teachers versus parents in, state, in schools or you know, political power, or even business leaders, as opposed to their, to their employees. So crisis of authority, crisis of leadership as well. Uh, I wanted to get your views on that. And the question, I think perhaps with Trump or Brexit or the European elections we've seen recently with the results of the far right you know, rising, is how do we stop them? Do you think we should stop them and how? And final question, <laughs> do you not think governments, you th you're saying they're quite weak, but we have some strong public institutions in our democracies in the US, so even private institutions like the media, for instance, traditional media. So these are just 
thoughts and questions. Okay, let me take that one at a time. The yeah. first one was authority and leadership. Oh. Yes. Okay. Um, and and um, I think, and, and I, by the way, I, I, I've been called all kinds of names. I've been called a, a uh, take techno doomster and a, a dark prophet. And I mean, um, I, I violently disagree with that. I, I, I believe that, um, you know, if you have pneumonia and you go to the doctor and the doctor says to you, you have pneumonia, you don't say to him, you're a doomster, you're very pessimistic. You say, oh, thanks. Now I can, now I can take my pill and get cured, okay? So my feeling about myself is that I'm, I'm that unfortunate doctor who has to tell the patient, you have pneumonia, but you're not gonna die. I'm not saying that, that don't believe in that. The fundamental political question, the fundamental political question of our moment, and I wish I, wish I could kind of have a flag that I wave around me everywhere <laughs> I go with it, is the crisis of authority. It's the crisis of authority. There is always a natural, I think, reflex by government, by institutions in general, to come out with policies that are, again, are, let's take care of this, this gap, this, this problem. But if these policies land in a, in a terrain that is completely devoid of authority, they're gonna sink without a trace. They're gonna sink without a trace. So the original problem that has to be tackled in politics is how do we re-endow the institutions of liberal democracy with um, legitimacy in the eyes of the public and therefore authority so that people who speak from those institutions um, are once again at least somewhat trusted. Um, that is my take on that. Uh, I, it's a deep, dark, philosophical question and uh, probably best not to go any deeper than that. I just wanna say it is the fundamental. It, if I were to have one thing that I want you all to take away is the question that you are confronting today is not about Macron, it's not about the Gilets jaunes, it's not about socialism, it's not about nationalism, it's about crisis of authority. And, and uh, it, it, in the end, um, the coalition between the public and the elites has to be solved in some way uh, before that, that authority is restored. And, and everything, including, by the way, it's not just um, uh, power authority, uh, but intellectual authority, fake news. Why are there fake news? Well, because real news has no authority. You know, there's no such thing as a trusted media. Media in the United States gets the same level of trust that government does. That's between 20 and 30%. So until you have an interlocutor, a person that's talking to you that you trust, authority will be um, uh, scarce. The second point, remind me. Your second question was? Uh, I think it was, sorry, it was all linked to this and crisis of leadership, crisis of authority, and what do you think, how we can perhaps stop or how do, well, and, and can governments or public institutions, what's their role within that? Well, I mean, I was a, I was a functionnaire. I was, I was a <laughs> member, I was a member of government. I was a bureaucrat. Um, I, I know that government does amazing things. Uh, not that I did them, but, but I saw them done. Um, the question is, um, Again, to, to, if you were asking uh, about the, the far right and stuff like that, and, uh, and they're bashing at government, um, there's an interesting dy dynamic there, okay? If you are a populist and you are running against the establishment, like Trump, take Trump, bashing the establishment, I mean, in a very kind of distempered, and, and, and I think nihilistic rhetoric. And then you get elected, which I, by the way, think surprised him. I don't think he was expecting to get elected. So then you have to think, now what do I do? You have two choices. You can keep bashing those institutions, uh, in which case, almost certainly, the economy is gonna tank. That's what happened to Alexis Tsipras in Greece, okay? And, and you're gonna lose your popularity. 
Or you can suddenly say, okay, now I'm one with the elites and I want to try and make do with them. In which case, the people that elected you that wanted radical change are going to desert you and, and turn against you. Donald Trump has found so far this weird way in which he governs. If you look at the way his government is, it's a conservative Republican government. All right? uh, I challenge anybody to tell me something he hasn't done. I mean, there's a few little things like tariffs that maybe are not old Republican ideas, but the broad, broad spectrum of his policies that a Jeb Bush even or a Ted Cruz wouldn't have done some version of the same thing if he had been president. But at the same time, his rhetoric is, is very extreme. So he's keeping the Republican base happy and he's keeping the, the, the public and revolt happy by kind of dividing himself. But the important thing is that the government, I have yet to see a government, and we'll see well, how Matteo Salvini ends up in Italy. They got their own ideas. Um, so government, I have no fear that it's going to disintegrate. The question is, how effective is it going to be, and, and how democratic is it going to be, and uh, how how is this uh, digital world that we're all living in uh, going to transform it? Um, and as for the right wing, the last question, you know, how do we how do we get it? Well, that's pretty easy. Okay, if all the mainstream parties give you no option, if if the difference between center left and center right is this, and you are over here, some strange person is going to come over here and say strange things and you go, well, there, it's not that. So let's go for him. And I mean, this is global. This is not uh, any one country. Rodrigo Duterte in uh, the Philippines, where there was a kind of a uh, concern about crime and security, bragged about going around the streets of Manila, Manila shooting drug dealers. Okay? He makes Trump looked like an etiquette book. I mean, Rodrigo Duterte, it, it, it makes Trump look like an etiquette book. So th these strange figures get elected because they are, not, they are not the sliver of what the mainstream has been. So if you don't give options, if the elites feel like, no, you don't deserve options, we have the solutions here, and I think outside of that it's just irrational or, or wrong, then they're gonna go to strange and unusual people. I'm not sure we have time for more questions or maybe a very short one and a very short yeah. answer. Sure okay, answer. I'll try to be Is that quick. a hint? So uh, put, you explained that for you, the public uh, being a mass of uh, a variety of ideas um, doesn't have one common uh, expectation when they revolt. And, um, I posit to you that actually uh, it does, because uh, uh, what the public wants is uh, power through information, to be closer to the elites, um, because you stated that the, the elites, uh, maybe in their mind, think that they are scientific in their way of leading, but actually uh, it's, it's the opposite, because there are more cult leaders in charming people, and then once they are they're, they're, uh, elected, they're, they're removed. Yes. And the idea is for the for the public when the revolt is to bring them closer to them, and they want actually a scientific process to to sh because scientists show you work, and uh, the issue and the issue with the the modern modern system is okay. It's better than monarchy because it, it was by blood, but now we have to bring us closer to to the power. So is it is the response to actually just introduce tools for the public to be able to uh, not only talk to the power, but then uh, weigh on the decision to, to less feel removed and uh, out of the questions of the, the decision. Yeah, the short answer is yes. You want a short answer? Yes. No, but um, yes, the question, of course, uh, the, the devil, as they say, is in the details. Um, I don't know how in a nation of 50 million or 320 million, you can uh, include everybody in the conversation. It can't be done. I think you can create mechanisms. I think the, the digital environment is such that a lot of creativity needs to be put on this question. But the answer is yes. That's exactly what, it, what the public 
craves, and I think what needs to happen, I think at the end of this turbulence, we will have power that is a lot closer. It's always gonna be, you know, there's always gonna be a hierarchy. Um, but I think at the end of this process, if, if it works to the advantage of democracy, uh, power will be closer and there will be many more of these consultative, probably digital uh, institutions and, and platforms. Thank you.